remind you that there's two dangers that we face when we're talking about spiritual warfare, which is the series that we're in right now. And, and I'm going to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, who really said it kind of, kind of this way. There's, there's two very serious dangers. One is the danger of just totally ignoring the reality of evil, just pretending there is no such thing. Now, we don't have to deal with demons anymore. In fact, uh, in an intellectual countries, there's actually been that teaching that uh, if you don't believe in demons, then they don't exist. You know, that's kind of dumb in my opinion, because the other is to simply, um, is to give too much attention to demons and to darkness and to evil. And so then we get afraid or we're going to stand out there and holler at Satan. And, all, and both sides, C.S. Lewis, both. Satan equally appreciates. Satan equally enjoys. If we give him too much attention or we give him no attention at all, he doesn't mind. Either way, as long as we're exaggerating or messed up, then we won't really do battle with him. This morning I want you to realize something very important. We do not need to be afraid of evil. God will protect us. Our challenge is, do we allow him to give the protection to us? Do we make use of the protection that he wants to give us? Or do we constantly step out from it? Do we go outside without our sunscreen? Ephesians, our text for this morning. I'm going to look specifically at verses 12 through 17. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand, to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. We're going to pause right there because next week we're going to continue with and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We'll go over that next Sunday. But the battle that we are fighting is not against flesh and blood. Note that. There's a spiritual battle that's being fought in the spiritual realm, whether we admit it or not, that's taking place all around us. Second Kings uh, has this wonderful story of Elisha and his servant. And Elisha's servant is allowed to see beyond the natural world. God actually gives him the ability to see the spiritual realm. So in 2 Kings 6, 15 to 18, it says this. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. They've come with a whole host of thousands of soldiers to simply arrest Elisha. The king wants Elisha because he's been speaking against him. And so he sends this huge army, like you needed a huge army. A couple of would have been enough, but he sends this huge army. So the servant of Elisha gets up, looks out like, oh no, there's an army all around us. We're in big trouble. Don't be afraid, verse 16, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed. And this might be a prayer some of us should pray. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. The battle is not against flesh and blood. How many of you have gotten into conflict with somebody that you love? Yeah, a show of hands. Yeah, let's be honest about it. Come on, be honest about it. Some of you aren't listening. How many of you, let me ask it again. How many of you have gotten into conflict with somebody you love? Okay. Okay. Some of you still aren't listening. You're already asleep. Okay. So. <laughs> How many of you have gotten in conflict with not only somebody you love, but somebody that's a follower of Jesus Christ? Raise your hands. Okay. Some of you are still aren't awake yet. Okay. <laughs> gotten in conflict with somebody who's a follower of Jesus Christ. So which one of you were sinning? <laughs> we wrestle not against 
flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness in heavenly places. There is a spiritual realm, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, whether you want to admit it or not, whether you want to face it, whether you want to run from it, whether you want to play ostrich and hide your head from it, there is a spiritual battle, a spiritual realm. Let me like prove that. Is God spiritual? Some of you aren't sure. You're thinking I'm asking you a trick question. <laughs> is God spiritual? Yes. Is God supernatural? Yes. Can you see God right here, right now? Yes. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Because he's spiritual. He's not physical. Like you see the chair, like you see the screen, like you see the walls and stuff like that. But that doesn't mean that God's not here. God is supernatural. If God is supernatural, then isn't there other things that might be out there in that spiritual realm we also can't see? And we're fighting against not flesh and blood. And here's one of the biggest things that happens to us. How many of you, when you get into that fight with that other person, you get upset and ticked at them? And you even start to not like them a little bit. And maybe you start to think some negative thoughts about them. And in the process, what happens to your relationship? Does your relationship generally, when you're in that thinking process, come closer? <laughs> Usually not. Usually when you're in that, in that process and you're starting to think negative of them and you're not liking them and you're starting to think bad thoughts because they're the one doing something wrong, obviously you're not. And now what happens? You start to become split from them. You start to become divided. And now they come and they say something and you're already thinking negative of them. And what happens? The negative gets a little bit more because you already have this negative thought about them. And what you think is just between you and them and no one else is listening is actually a supernatural battle taking place not between flesh and blood but between principalities and powers, rulers of darkness in heavenly places trying to divide you and the people you love. And watch out, folks, because we are so vulnerable to it every single day. And especially within our homes. In our homes, the places that ought to be places of safety and security and unity and love, in those places where we ought to find peace and solace and refuge and, and, and comfort, guess what? There's a battle that starts to take place there. And it's a spiritual battle. It's not just a fleshly battle between you and people. The battle is not against flesh and blood. So what does Ephesians 6 say? Therefore, put on the full armor of God. Get ready. You got to put your arm on. You got to get yourself ready before you go into the battle. And the battle is happening whether you like it or not. Martin Lloyd Jones said, We have seen that the devil is never quite so subtle and never quite so successful as when he succeeds in persuading people that he does not exist at all. Oh, I'm not fighting evil right now. I'm just fighting my husband or my wife or my friend or my brother or my sister or my neighbor. It's just, it's just them. And if they were any better, things would be nice. I found an really interesting translation of a gentleman named Phil Fields. He's a missionary, and he, he works with pioneer Bible translators. And he has taken and translated the Bible into the Indone one of the Indonesian languages. Some of you know that there's thousands. He translates from then the English, from the, the Indonesian language, he translates back into English. And it's a very interesting translation. Listen to this. Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. As final instructions, you should each become strong because you keep on hoping completely in the Lord's amazing power. Be strong because you believe in God's power. And also because you've become one with Him. Just like a soldier wears his equipment for war, you must wear all the battle equipment that God gives us. In that way, you can reject the devil's lies. By the way, that is the battle, folks. The battle is the lies that Satan wants to tell us, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. For we aren't fighting against people on this earth, but we fight against evil spirits and all the powers who rule those evil spirits. They're the ones who now control this dark world from the sky above. That's why you need to use all the tools of war given by God so that when the enemy comes to attack you, you won't run, but can oppose him and keep enduring until the war is over. Some of us, if we saw a demon, would run. They're ugly, they're nasty, and, and we don't want to see them. Some of us get into battle and we run. 
And he said, no, we need to be able to stand firm. We, gotta have, we need to use the weapons. So he goes on, verse 14, so stand firm. Hold on to the true teaching from God. Because true teaching is like a belt that makes you ready to act. Live a righteous life. Because a righteous life is like a metal vest that will protect you from the enemy's attacks. And keep holding on to the good news about Christ. That news helps you to feel calm in the protection of God. Continually hold on to that news just like a soldier always wears strong boots so that you can stand firm in war. Besides that, keep believing in the Lord. For your fully believing faith, your fully believing faith is like a shield that protects you from all of the flaming arrows that the devil shoots at us. Keep on being certain that God has saved you because that is like your war helmet. And hold on to all of God's words like holding a sword because his words have the power of the Holy Spirit. How would we summarize all of the armor of God? That's what I shared with the kids earlier. If you want to summarize the armor of God, Romans 13, 14. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And the second part of that verse, we're going to look at it in a couple of different ways as we try to think about the various forms of armor that God has given to us. The battle is about sin. The battle is in our mind. The battle starts with our thoughts. So he says, put on the belt of truth. John 8, 31 says, to the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. If we really do what Jesus said, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Did the, did the Jews speak truth to Jesus Christ when they said, we've never been, we're not slaves, we're Jews, we're chosen, we're wonderful, right? Did they speak truth? Well, first off, Jesus says they're not speaking truth because he says, you're slaves to sin. But the fact is, is that they haven't always been free. They've been slaves to Egypt. They've been slaves to Assyria. They're now slaves to Rome. And as Jesus said, they're slaves to sin. These people have been in slavery a whole bunch, haven't they? So when they say, oh, we've never been in slavery, it's a lie. Take note. It's one of the battles. The first step to overcoming evil is to know the truth. And that includes not just knowing the truth about God, but knowing the truth about ourselves. The second step is to stop listening to the liar. Stop believing the lies. Have you ever heard this one? You can't be free. You don't have the power to overcome this sin. You just need to learn to live with this. You don't have any reason for hope. And the liar lies to us on a consistent basis. And the sad thing is too many of us believe his lies. Know the truth and stop listening to the liar. <coughs> Excuse me. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. We need to help one another hear and know the truth. And we need to get rid of the lies and put off the falsehood. I'm going to share an illustration from Neil Anderson, who's written a book called Freedom in Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. We're more vulnerable to Satan's deception than to any of his other schemes. Why? Because when he tempts you or accuses you, you know it. But when he deceives you, you don't know it, do you? How many of you know when you're being deceived? If you're being deceived, you don't know it. You're just believing the lie. If he can enter your church, I'm talking about Satan or his demons, if he can enter your church, your home, or your mind undetected and get you to believe a lie, then he can control your life, your home, and your ministry. Sad to say he's doing just that across our land by deceiving 
many people. You cannot overcome Satan's deception by human reason. You can only do it by God's revelation. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Jesus prayed, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. It's critical that when you put on the armor of God, you start with the bell of truth. The light of truth is the only valid weapon against the darkness of deception. By the way, have you realized where the belt of truth covers? Your inner parts. The belt of truth was one of the first things that the soldier would put on. It was what held everything together. And by the way, one of the things that you would use the belt of truth for is that, because you remember the soldiers in that day would have like skirts. And so what you would do is you would take that skirt and you'd pull and tie it up and you'd put it underneath your belt so that now you could run without <laughs> tripping over your skirt. Jesus talks about that even as he girded his loins. You remember when he got down to wash the disciples' feet, what did it say he did? He pulled up his skirt, he pulls it around and basically tucked it under his waist so that he could kneel down without <laughs> stepping on his skirt. Girls, you understand that, right? We guys don't know what it's like until we put on a robe and then we all trip over ourselves. But we are supposed to gird our most private parts, our most personal parts with truth. And where do we feel the lack of truth when we are deceitful? In your inner parts. Ray Steadman in his book, uh, Spiritual Battle, Winning the Battle Daily with Satan said, when you have girded yourself with the belt of truth, you're ready for battle. When you are threatened by discouragement, depression, spiritual apathy and coldness and similar moods, you fight back by remembering that you first became a Christian by surrounding yourself with truth. You remind yourself that in coming to Jesus Christ, you found the truth behind all things. You found the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, the secret of the universe, the final reality. What does he say next, along with the belt of truth? He says, now take the breastplate of righteousness. What's going to cover your heart? This metal shield that's going to protect you. It might have been uh, a mail uh, that, that was uh, like woven, so to speak, metal together. It could have been an actual breastplate of, of metal. But therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The breastplate of righteousness. To be righteous. How many of us are righteous? So let's say, say it differently. How many of us are perfect? Well, okay, how many of us have been perfect this week at least? Okay, I'm sorry. How many of you have been perfect on your way to church this morning? You, oh my goodness. Put the breastplate of righteousness. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What makes us righteous? Not us, not our behavior, but what Jesus Christ has done for us. He's, don't worry about failure. Do any of you fail? Don't worry about failure. Ephesians 5 says, live in the light. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. What did Jesus do for us? He became sin for us so that we could be set free from sin and receive the righteousness of God in him. Because of Jesus Christ, we actually become righteous. That's what it means to really be clothed by Jesus, doesn't it? God looks at us and he no longer sees the sin, he sees us as righteous. How many of you look in the mirror and say, oh my, I messed up again. <laughs> Philippians says it this way, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived by, from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. God makes me righteous through Jesus Christ, and I trust him to do that. Do you ever feel unworthy? Wonder if you really are forgiven? Even maybe wonder sometimes if you're really a Christian. By the way, that's one of the lies that Satan likes to use against us. <clears throat> Do you ever think that God 
has rejected you or that he's going to? He's no longer interested in you? See, as Christians, we are constantly aware of our failures and shortcomings, aren't we? And unless you've just totally um, t killed off your conscience, don't you know when you're doing something wrong? See, the first joy of faith has faded and people often come to doubt God's presence with them, their, His love and forgiveness of their sin. There's a nagging sense of guilt that can attack us. Our conscience needles us and it makes us feel unhappy and miserable, doesn't it? I'm sure you guys um, at the house, have you felt that sometimes? <laughs> any of us who battles any kind of habitual sin, doesn't it beat you up every time you do it? Our conscience makes us feel unhappy, miserable, and we feel that God blames us. And we need to take note, this is a satanic attack, a crafty and devilish accusation, a lie designed to undermine what God's doing in your life. And so how do you answer that attack? You answer by remembering that you're wearing the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness that's been bought and paid for you by Jesus Christ. Righteousness that you don't deserve, but because of Him, He says you are now righteous. Jesus. You fight Him with the truth. Did you really deserve God's grace? And what God did for you on the cross? No. And so when you came to Christ, what did you have to admit? You had to quit trying to be good enough to earn it. You had to admit you couldn't earn it. You came to God the Father on infinite merits of His Son who died for you. It's not your own miserable, tattered righteousness that covers your heart, Stedman says, but the solid, impenetrable righteousness of Jesus. And His righteousness is durable enough to deflect any of the arrows of Satan's accusations. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Romans says it this way, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law but under grace. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then what does he say next? Well, if we're going to run well, unless you're like Paul Fournier who likes to run barefoot, don't, don't, forget why, don't just, he, he's goofy, okay? But most of us need to have protection on our feet if we're going to go running out in the, in the woods or on the street or any place like that. Then we need to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Romans 5 says it this way, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, made righteous, Christ. Because of what Jesus did, we've got now a peace. We've got a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He goes on, he says, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of glory. And what is all that? We've got to be ready, ready with the good news. Because we've experienced the good news. Isaiah it's, it says it this way. Awake, awake, Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor. Jerusalem, the holy city. The uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Romans says this way, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. Put on the gospel of peace on your feet. Get out there and let somebody else know that what God's done for you. All you got to do is find somebody worse off than you, right? <laughs> Tell someone what God has done for you. And then he says, take the shield of faith. So you've got a breastplate of righteousness, loins girded with truth. You put on the, the shoes of the gospel of peace, and then he says, take up the shield of faith. 
Why? Because you see, the enemy is going to throw darts at you. Enemy is going to try to tempt you. Enemy is going to say lies to you. And you've got to be able to, to stop and extinguish those, those lies. And how does he say to do that? Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do we resist? Hold up the shield of faith. He says, we're supposed to extinguish the darts. What are the darts? Have you thought about that? What are the darts that are being extinguished when we hold up the shield of faith? The darts are the whispers of the demons. The whispers of lies that come from the devil. We need to trust the conviction that Jesus is the Messiah, that God is the creator and the ruler. Ephesians 1.13 And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. You became one with Jesus Christ when you listened to that gospel and heard, what the, heard that truth. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's come upon you, has marked you with a seal, and you are protected. What do you have to do when you're taking up the shield of your faith saying, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe with, you're with me. Jesus, I believe your Holy Spirit has already anointed and protected me. And I have the power by the Holy, power of the Holy Spirit to discern and to defeat evil in my life. I've got that. That's the shield of faith. And by the way, Satan's standing over and saying, no, you don't. No, you're not good enough. No, you're still a sinner. No, you're still messed up. Look, look at what you just did. Look at the thought you just said. Look at the bad thing you just did. No, no see, that's not true. So you're really not saved. You got to call it what it is. Tell the liar it's a lie. Tell him Jesus has already died for you. He's already come into your life. And you're going to celebrate that fact because you're his. Take the shield of faith. And then there's an interesting one. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. And I think that the helmet of salvation is so critical because the battle is really in our heads. <laughs> I was just about to say, think about it, but I guess I should. <laughs> think about it. Where's the battle? Where, did, where does sin begin? Sin begins in your thoughts. Sin begins in something you imagine. Sin begins in something you taste, you feel. It all starts there in your head. What is John 3, 16? For God, so, say, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. How? By simply believing. By simply accepting Jesus, you have salvation. He says, look, cover your head with salvation. This gift that has come from Jesus Christ that you can't earn, you can't do anything to make it happen, you simply say yes to it. 2 Timothy says it's kind of like this. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. With eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. The battle, folks, is in your head. The battle's in the mind. The, you've all probably heard the King James Version of Proverbs 23 said, As, as a man thinketh, so is, is he. The NIV has kind of a, an unusual translation to that, to that verse. But in the footnote down below it says, it switches the translation, it says, Or as he thinks within himself, so is he. In the new NASB, for as he thinks within himself, so is he. He says to you, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. Salvation defeats our doubt, our fear, our temptation, our thoughts. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. It's probably one of the most powerful scriptures that we could live out in our lives. Paul is saying to us, when you're anxious, when you're afraid, when you've lost peace, when you're in sin, all those kinds of things, whatever battle you're going through, if you will think about good, pure, honorable, just, excellent, praiseworthy things, God will protect you. God will give you that peace that goes beyond understanding. And then 2 Corinthians 10, it's a passage I mentioned earlier. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have power to break down strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The helmet of salvation says, I'm going to take the thoughts I'm thinking. I'm going to, when they're a lie, I'm going to call them that. And I'm going to instead think on the good things that God's done for me. I'm going to 
grab a hold of these thoughts that are really trying to mess me up and declare what they are, take them captive, take control of them, and the helmet of salvation is going to protect my thoughts. A young lady wrote back to Dr. Anderson who wrote Steps to Freedom and he, Dr. Anderson used to have a whole workshop and seminar that he did with this to try to help set people free. And she wrote him this way. Dear Dr. Anderson, I will always remember the day I came to you for counsel and prayer. Ever since that day, I have felt such freedom. There are no more voices or feelings of heaviness in my brain. I'm even enjoying a physical sense of release. Satan has returned many times trying to clobber me with those old thoughts. But his hold on me has been broken. Praise God. I'll never forget what you told me. You said those negative thoughts about God and myself were lies from Satan. You said, I have the power through Jesus Christ to rebuke Satan and get rid of the evil thoughts. It has taken me a while to really believe that with all my heart. But lately, I've decided to fight back. And guess what she says next? It works. It works. It works. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand and keep on standing. Gird your loins with truth, not lies. Put, take up the breastplate of righteousness because you are right with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Put the gospel of peace on your feet. You have experienced good news. Start living it out and tell other people about it, what God has already done for you. Take the helmet of salvation, which will cover your thoughts. Ah. And next week, and take up, after you've taken the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, all the lies that are keeping on coming, then next week we'll learn about one of those weapons and the sword of the Spirit, which is word of the God. Isaiah says this to us. Be strong in the Lord. Isaiah 40, 25. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. Who is more powerful? God is way above the powers of evil. But folks, we have a problem. Our problem is that we give in to sin. We allow sin to control. We allow lies from Satan to control us and break us and shame us and wound us. And in the process, we give in to evil instead of the one who set the starry host in the heavens, the one who created the universe, the one who gives life to all things, the one who came and died on a cross and rose from the dead and wants to give us life. We give in instead to the lie. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Please bow your head. You know, you can't pick up the breastplate of righteousness if you haven't accepted what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. You can't be good enough to be considered righteous. None of us can, except that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross. In order for you to have that breastplate of righteousness, you need to say yes to Jesus Christ. And if you haven't said yes to him, then I invite you to do that right now. And to do that with something tangible, to raise your hand as a statement to God, I want the breastplate of righteousness. I want you to cover my sins. God sees that. And God has given you 
because of that commitment, God has already given you righteousness in his eyes. You are perfect, holy, set apart. Now, stop believing the lies that Satan wants you to listen to. Secondly, some of you are still in shame because you know you still blow it. Sometimes you actually choose to sin. You give in to a temptation. And if you really thought back over it, you gave in to some kind of a lie. Right now you need to tell Satan he's a liar and he has no longer authority over your life. And if you want to make that statement, don't be afraid of it. You too, raise your hand. I'm telling the liar that he no longer has authority in my life. I'm going to live for Jesus and I'm not going to believe the lies that I am not forgiven, that I'm not a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to put on all that armor. You raise your hand and you tell God that. And then you be ready. When temptation comes, you tell the liar he doesn't have authority because you belong to Jesus Christ. Father God, Thank you for what you're doing in us. Set us free. Help us like this young lady to do the work and to believe it. That in your armor we can stand against evil and be victorious. In Jesus' name, amen.